Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. science. I'm glad you uh, you sucked that down before we turned it on the air. <laughs> wow. It's just water, Charlotte. Please, cut, please cut that comment. <laughs> 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 oh, if people yeah. only knew what all Charlotte had to screen out of the show. What kind of nonsense goes on here? <laughs> yeah, because of her, they think we're professional. oh if they only knew yeah well Bronson uh, I feel like I wouldn't be doing you justice if I didn't start out by saying this is all your fault Mm. yeah (laughs) I guess it is all the way down to you know finally getting to wild turkey science and that being a thing started with you dragging me down into a little room, a little closet in Thompson Hall to record on Deer University. And under it, the stairs I was hearing earlier. <laughs> yeah, it was under yeah. The, Paint the full like picture. Paint the full picture. Did it have a naked bulb hanging from a wire? I don't remember that. It, it was a step up from that, Will. Okay. Yeah. But only, there was one, some, only one step. <laughs> there was some carpet in the room, but it was not glued down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it was uh, it was an area that had been out of use for a few years, and it kind of turned into a departmental storage area. Mm-hmm. But it was a place that was relatively quiet mm-hmm. that yeah. that we that could get a, away from the noise. It was a good room for for yeah. what we were using it for. But that was a long time ago, and uh, I didn't even know what a podcast was before we recorded. One, I don't remember what episode it was for you, but it was my first. I think it was like the fourth or fifth on Deer University. Yep. Uh, you and Steve Damaris both had never heard, or you behaved as, as if you had never heard of what a podcast is. I had not, so, I had heard the term before, but I did not. I had never listened to one. I did not know what it was. What year was well, this? It was 2016 or 17. Oh, my God. Uh, Bronson, you'd know. 2017. I think that's when we yeah. started Deer University. Yeah. Less you than a decade ago. you didn't know ago. what a podcast was. I had never listened to one. I knew that people listened to them. I didn't know that they were a big thing like they were okay. becoming. But, I mean, I, really, I wasn't even on social media really at the time either because I don't use social media for personal stuff. So, look where we are now. And see, look, you could still, like, if Bronson had never pulled you in, you could still be happy. But now you have <laughs> now you have to podcast and use social media. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, you know I I find that it's it's uh, rewarding often, but there's also some trolls out there that just <laughs> that's what they're gonna do. Oh yeah, absolutely. So it definitely yeah. uh, makes you a target sometimes. It sure does. You got to put yourself out there and. Uh, we're human beings and we're going to misspeak sometimes and possibly interpret the data the wrong way. But the good thing about it too, is it's kind of living. And so you always have your next episode where you can clean something up or clarify Mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully make amends that Mm -hmm. way. We had to do that. Well, and we're, so have I, I mean, look at the amount of misinformation going around, like, you know, us messing up honestly is, probably a, a breath of fresh air for some, even though, you know, we might get it wrong sometimes it's on accident and we try to correct it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, so Marcus, what uh, prompted you to invite a deer guy onto wild turkey science today? Well, you know, we're, we've run out of turkey guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you know, Bronson, I don't think we need to introduce you. Uh, most people probably know, who you are already because you're really uh, prominent 
in multiple facets of the same people that listen to this. I'm sure uh, they, they've heard your name, but uh, uh, co-director of the MSU Deer Lab, founder of the Deer University podcast. I'm not going to say how many years you've been at it, but extension wildlife specialists and lots of accolades to go. I'm in double it, digits. So. Let's keep it there. Oh. Double digits. Yeah. There you go. Of accolades. And just for clarification. Accolades or years. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Cause that, that yeah. <laughs> definitely years. I don't know about accolades. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. sounded like a humble brag. Uh, oh yeah. I'm in double yeah, digits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was talking about years. <laughs> yeah. Can you turn your camera so we can see all the trophies? <laughs> yeah. No, we don't need to do that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, well, to, to be honest, we are starting to get a lot of questions and, People are really curious about this this uh, wave of interest that seems to be really taking hold in the deer world and certainly in agriculture uh, of regenerative ag and how that might mm-hmm. apply to your food plotting. And it's been, from what I can tell, primarily focused on deer, but I'm starting to get some questions and I also have some curiosity myself and how that might affect turkey use and productivity in those fields. So that's really yeah. why I, w- I really wanted to have you on is to talk specifically about regenerative ag, what that is, because I think Will and I both agree that we don't know that much about <laughs> what it even is. All I know uh, about is, is degenerative ag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a different thing, Will. Yeah. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I just I keep getting confused. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, uh, the, yeah, I guess I'll just turn it over to you, Bronson, and let you start where you'd like to. But uh, we'd really like to know what it is from your perspective and then start talking about how it might, uh, well, how it's used for deer and how that might affect turkeys. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I will try to do it justice. Um, be forewarned here. There's probably going to be a lot of rambling going on here. But me? Because it, it, <laughs> with, with me, okay. I'm going to join in the ramble with you. Our okay. audience is used to that. <laughs> um, it, it is a relatively new topic. So compared to food plots, you know, that's been around for decades and decades. Um, regenerative agriculture, I would say, is more on the uh, born of the food production side and agriculture for humans. Mm-hmm. And so it's almost like a, a step further than say organic. Hmm. And so why don't we start with comparing and and contrasting? Uh, What is typically done nowadays, the same way with food plots, is what we would term conventional agriculture or conventional agricultural techniques. Mm -hmm. And and that's the system that y'all and your listeners are all familiar with. It's someone like me with an, uh, an extension appointment I've given hundreds and hundreds of talks about the steps of getting your soil sample and applying your lime. And then from your soil sample, your NPK application and a burn down with glyphosate on and on and on tillage, uh, the call to packing after that, et cetera. Those are conventional agriculture techniques. Contrast that with what is called regenerative agriculture is essentially you remove all of those conventional forms or those techniques from the system, from the growing system. So we start out by either eliminating or completely uh, reducing or completely eliminating tillage. So no more disking up of the soil, no more synthetics. So no more pesticides, no more herbicides, no more application of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and stuff like that. Uh, Lime lime to be included? uh, What Luke and I have termed uh, a regenerative purist, someone who is 100% all in, they would say you you don't even need to apply lime. Hmm. Some would say you could maybe fast forward a little bit by getting your pH up from, say, 5.1 to 6.4. But I, w- I would say that's really debatable. So no, no more tillage. So 
No, no more what, synthetics. What, what's the? So you're implying there's another term. So there's a purist. What's what's the? Is there another version of this? The some other term? Well, th- this is just us. This is not okay. some broad term other people use. You haven't published your book on it yet? No. no. Okay. L- so, Luke and I call it some some common sense. The realist. Oh. Let's call it the, the purist and the realist. <laughs> okay. So, so in other words, if you start out, Marcus, with your favorite plant, if you have a, a homogenous stand of ryegrass, <laughs> then you might want to begin your journey I, I got, in regenerative ag with an herbicide burn down. I literally got the sniffles just from you saying ryegrass. Oh, yeah. It's, it's that bad. Yeah, it's your favorite plant. <laughs> I've noticed that. Yeah. Send, y'all send Marcus some seeds. He'll appreciate it. <laughs> Not Ooh. ryegrass seeds. That's what I meant. <laughs> no. Marcus, I, I, I can see a podcast sponsor coming your way. Uh oh. <laughs> well, we're not selling <laughs> ryegrass seed, I can tell you that. So it it is a uh it's a completely different way of growing plants. And there's and there's trade offs doing it. Uh, another part of, of regenerative ag is a diverse seed blend. And so you might have anywhere from eight to 10 to 15 different species of plants. And um, you also are always keeping the soil covered. And so hence you're you're not disking, but you're always have, the bottom line is you always have a variety of plant roots in the ground. And so these diverse blends of food plot forages, you have all the different plant types. So there will typically be a couple grasses, a couple legumes, a couple brassicas, a couple non-leguminous forbs example. And so you basically have this really diverse mixture. And ultimately what you are trying to do, and hence the regenerative part of this, is you are restoring, quote, soil health which essentially means you are restoring soil biology and ecology or what is often called the soil microbiome Mm -hmm. is you are trying to get all of those below ground, the bacteria, the fungi, the micro, all of those organisms functioning ecologically the way they had done for, you know, thousands and thousands of years until we disrupted that process with, depending on your perspective, a very effective way to grow plants conventionally. I mean, no one can argue that that is an effective way to grow plants. But what you're doing in that process is you are disrupting the soil ecology. So some people may say, well, who cares about that? Well, there is some evidence now, and this literally goes back to USDA data circa World War II and after. And when you start looking at the the nutrient quality of some of the the minerals that are found in our common human foods, the potato, carrot, etc. When you look at, and I'm just making one up here, but let's just say calcium that was in a carrot in 1950 versus a carrot nowadays typically a lot of the mineral density in these vegetables and food is a lot less. Hmm. Some of them, not so much, some of them significantly less. And are you saying that that is attributable to this lack of soil biology as opposed to like a new variety of carrots or. Well, there there's potentially a lot of stuff going on there, Marcus. That's a very good point. I think, some would say that when you diminish soil health, a consequence could be as you described there. I mean, it, it could be that it is affecting the soil biology is not working like it was supposed to, and therefore nutrient uptake was not what it used to be. But then there's also another facet is selection. And when, when you think about what does, and, and this is not to denigrate in any way, shape, or form a producer, they got to make a living. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, those are the facts. They got bills to pay. Mm-hmm. They want to maximize profit. They want to be profit, profitable. You mm-hmm. know, it's not usually about, I want to make huge gains. They just want to make profit, not yeah. lose money. So think about what 
a producer or a plant breeder that's representing a producer, what are they going to select for? They're going to select for what they sell. Mm. They're going to select for bushels per acre. And so over time, you all start seeing, whether it be corn or soybean or wheat or whatever, you start selecting for plant traits Mm -hmm. that are going to maximize the amount of yield. We're never selecting for plant quality. Mm -hmm. We're not selecting for how much phosphorus is in the vegetable or anything. It's, It's all about yield. And then as we become more and more and more efficient at producing bushels per acre, there's only so much soil nutrients and minerals available on an acre of land. And so we're maximizing the amount of above ground biomass that is cropped and sold. And it's prop- most likely it is diluting the amount of nutrients that can be in each bushel. And it's actually called the dilution effect, hmm. the mineral or nutrient dilution effect, because hmm. we're producing so much more above ground, but there's only X amount of the the nutrient substrate below ground that you can pull that from. So it's like by default, if you're going to produce more above ground, the good stuff, the nutrients have to be diluted. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope I didn't spin off too far down the uh, uh, tangent there. The word regenerative, let's get it back this way. The word regenerative agriculture essentially means that you are trying to restore the soil ecology and the soil biology. That is what's different uh, versus something that is say an organic. I went to the grocery store and I got organic vegetables or organic strawberries. That is just categorizing essentially for, uh, did it have an herbicide? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just something like that of how Mm -hmm. the plant was treated. Because you can still use conventional tillage with organically grown produce, right? You hit the nail on the head. Exactly Mm -hmm. right. Exactly right. So those are very different. And a lot of people blend those together. Regenerative equals organic. So what you could typically say, if something is truly regenerative with this process, it would be organic. Mm. But something that organic is not necessarily regenerative. Mm -hmm. So Bronson, what are, you know, you mentioned about restoring the soil. I think you used the term like soil biology. So what are some things that we could measure that change from con- like a field that's, you know, where conventional tillage is being practiced to one where regenerative ag has been practiced for some amount of time? That is a very good question, Will. <laughs> it's it's one that uh, I don't know if there's a lot of established okay. good answers for. How many the, worms the, are, are... Well, I hear about that a lot. Or scoop. <laughs> I do. I, yeah. I hear about the earthworm I do too. That's aspect why I said a lot. <laughs> and, I, and I don't I don't know. One way or another, earthworms yeah. seem good for soil in general. Like I, yeah. I like yeah. them in my vegetable garden, but I, I don't have yeah. any data to say you know, what how that affects things one way or another. Well, and a lot of the stuff you're talking about, Bronson, you can't see visibly with your eye. Right. So... Well, I, I think uh, an earthworm index, I think that would, would be a good correlate mm-hmm. for good, quote, soil health. Uh, organic matter, Will, would be another one. Is if you go down this road, in theory, now it might be two years, it may be five years, but you should see an increase over time of organic matter. Right. So that you get that sense. from a soil sample. You just take that a soil is sample. One, yeah. Yep. That would be a measure you could get from your traditional $8 soil sample. But when you really want to start measuring the the ecology, the interaction Mm -hmm. of all of those microbes, that is some really, really sophisticated microbiology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I should say, uh, Luke, who you both know, Luke Resop, this is his PhD project, is uh, more than a year ago, you know, we started hearing a lot about people moving towards regenerative ag techniques to grow food plots, food plots for deer. And some people are saying, and they may be 100% right. I mean, they may be 100% right, is that once you restore the soil ecology, biology, aka soil health, that the plants will be more nutrient dense for some of the reasons we talked about earlier. If we have a very smart herbivore, Marcus, in your previous life when you did some deer work, 
and will too. Still do, Bronson. I and still, still do. do. <laughs> I was planning out some nutrient analysis this morning, actually. <laughs> An herbivore via the feedback system that Fred Provenza did such a good job teaching us all about. Uh, an herbivore ought to be able to detect where it's foraging and if it is getting more nutrients. Mm -hmm. If that is the case, could a regenerative food plot then offer greater nutrition per acre and number two, be more attractive to deer? So that is what we set out to answer with, with Luke's PhD project. And so in three different states, a lot of study sites, we have side-by-side -side comparisons of a regenerative ag food plot next to a conventional ag food plot, similar plant species. Of course, the region is going to have a much more diverse blend of species, but we have species in common in the region versus the conventional where we're going to be able to test for are there differences in nutrient density mm -hmm. and then we're also measuring deer response mm -hmm. via camera traps so we're going to look at which ones are more attractive to deer in that way so mm -hmm. essentially it was just a way for let's let's jump in with both feet there, there's a lot of talk about regenerative ag and now even for wildlife management and deer management so let, let's just test some of these claims that we've heard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so do y'all have any data to share on that yet uh, Will, we're in year one. Mm -hmm. We have some very preliminary stuff, but not enough. I would feel comfortable sure. sharing sure. at this moment. Um, and in all fairness to regen techniques, we, we really can't expect to see anything in year one. Sure. It's going to take a couple years, yeah. in theory, to, to restore that ecology. I gotcha. So I have a few questions. The first one. Are you, so are you having Luke out there digging up, see how many worms are in the pots? We we have talked about that. I, I don't <laughs> think at this point you have to that will have that, that will be a formal metric that that he records, but it very well may. Uh, but that is something. Yeah, we have talked about that. He would he's going to take note of. Yeah. Okay. Well, more serious question. So in your comparison, you said there was eight to ten forages in the. At minimum. Regen I already forgot what it's called. Regenerative ag <laughs> plots. Uh, okay. So that's how many do you have in your study? I'm sorry. How many what? H how many forages are in your regenerative treatment? Marcus, it'll depend on if that's warm season or cool season. And I actually don't have that exact number off the top of my head, but, but okay. it is, so you're, it is 10, you're 10 doing, or more. Okay. In both seasons. Yeah. Wow. All right. So how many are, what, or maybe, you know, what, or do you have like a standard mix that you're using for your conventional mix? Yeah. So the, the, Conventional, for example, uh, for cool season would be your your very typical recipe that you would recommend and Will would recommend and I would recommend. It's a so like a cereal, cereal grain, grain a clover. like wheat. Go have yeah. a crimson clover and another clover, mm. uh, brassica even, but it's just a very mm. standard recipe. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then is it? Do you have a warm season conventional planting as well? We do. And, and is that a single species, like cow peas or soybeans or something? Uh, deer vetch. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so every time the conventional versus the regen, we make sure we have a couple plants in the conventional that are also in the regen mm -hmm. so we yeah. can compare nutrient density. But in the in the warm season, do you have other species or is it just the vetch? Um, let's see. I believe that is going to be a... Uh, uh, deer vetch Alice clover for okay. conventional. Yeah. So very common yeah. planting. Okay. Well, I think it's pretty clear based on some of my questions that I don't know how you're going about this. Can you describe what the process looks like? I think most people are probably aware for the conventional, but particularly for regenerative what yeah. is the actual process you're implementing? 
Well, it, it it's one thing that's interesting. And uh, if I if I forget to loop back to your question, Marcus, remind me what what it was. But th- this is something that's important. Oh, so you're just is, not going to answer my question? No, I, I <laughs> okay. am, but I'm gonna, probably going to forget what it was because I, I want to get this point in here. Okay. Um, one thing is that you may look at regenerative ag, and, and again, when all the reading and the podcasts and stuff I listen to, most of this is based on production for human food. You know, mm. producers raising, uh, generating human food is that most of the time there, there are some instances where this is not the case, but most of the time when you're looking at bushels per acre, so a soybean bushels per acre, corn, uh, a regenerative framework is never going to beat what the conventional ag can do. So we have decades and decades and decades of fertilization and herbicides and all, you know, that we can really maximize production with conventional ag. It's really, really difficult for regenerative ag to beat it in terms of bushels per acre. But one thing that the regenerative producers very often report is, I don't care about bushels per acre. I care about profit. Well, that's what mm-hmm. I was thinking is cost per bushel produced. That's it. That is it. Yeah, and you can so reduce costs substantially. When you reduce those input costs, when you reduce those trips on the field, when you reduce the, the pesticide application halfway through the growing season over and over again, your, your typical regenerative setup is going to be uh, terminating one crop while you're planting the other one. Mm-hmm. And, and did, so back to your question, mm-hmm. Marcus, does it I'm cut, sorry, Will. Does it cut down on irrigation as well? It, it should, yes. Yeah. It absolutely should. So one because, question you're, you're referring to, and it's related to what you're saying right now, uh, you're referring to the agricultural for humans mm-hmm. work. So That's right. Is there a body of work showing or demonstrating that this process does – influence our food system in the way that you're saying? Yeah, there there are several examples, uh, typically from institutes that have really taken this on and nonprofits that have really examined this, but they will go through, for example, and what is the budget for someone doing this with whatever crop you're talking about from a regenerative standpoint versus wide open, 100% conventional and typically, like we say, the conventional will win in bushels per acre. But then oftentimes, you know, you hear this all the time on the conventional side is um, I had a record yield, but I didn't make any money. Mm-hmm. I mean, you if you start listening to some, mm-hmm. some, some of these people and, and what they're reporting, I can have record y- yield. I, I mean, I literally heard this on a podcast one time from someone was uh, I, I had the county record this year and bushels per acre of whatever commodity it was, and I was not profitable. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that just shows you the amount of monetary inputs that it mm-hmm. took. And so regenerative would be just the opposite. So looping back to your question, Marcus, is the process it is going to be. Um, so let's say you are now, you had a cool season plot, regenerative plot, and you're going to put in your warm season. You can either do it on the same trip Or you can make two trips or passes, I should say. What people that do this at scale, they may have, and and there's some debate, some people like uh, drilling into uncrimped and some people like to drill into crimped. But the bottom line is you are terminating the existing crop with a roller crimper. And so you've seen that it's a big drum either on the front or the back of a tractor that has these blades. It's like a roller chopper. Mm -hmm. And it is basically crushing or mashing or pinching. You know, think of your cereal grain like rye, not rye grass, cereal rye. Let's just go with wheat to be safe. (laughs) Let's go with wheat, Will. Good point. Well, uh, rye, uh, as I understand it, is the more commonly promoted grass in the food plot space right now. Oh, is that right? Yeah, cereal rye, not rye grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is a lot of confusion on this, and I have been talking to several people in various ways, including over the phone, where there's clearly confusion between these two. So we're rye, cereal rye, in the genus Cicale, looks a lot like 
uh, wheat and oats, and particularly the seed head looks a lot like wheat or, or triticale, uh, that's a cross. Uh, whereas ryegrass is an invasive plant, it is commonly planted in food plots, and it's commonly a filler in, a, in mixes that you might buy somewhere. And it also causes lots of problems and is an undesirable forage for all sorts of reasons. And Bronson was kind of picking earlier because we released a video that all of us, including in this podcast we're on, and, and uh, Mark McConnell that does quail work, also trying to convey that message to people that, you know, ryegrass is not good for any of these species and we really need to quit planting it. And uh, a lot of people that even have never planted it still have a problem and need to do something about it if they want their fields to be productive for, for game species. So yeah. sorry for the sidebar, but I felt it necessary. But mm-hmm. so cereal rye is, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bronson, the, nope, the one that's... Right the cereal grain that's usually used. Yeah. And, and there'll be others, but yeah, you're, you're right. Probably the most common is, is cereal rye. And there are a lot of uh, nutrient scavenging characteristics uh, uh, about cereal rye. I can't explain that. I don't understand it, but people did you say, that do n- understand did it. Did you say nutrient scavenging? <laughs> yeah. And what is I, that? I, I regret even mentioning that because I don't <laughs> fully understand how All that right. works. That sounds like a bad thing. <laughs> As I understand it, 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 it is able to uh, acquire nutrients that maybe other forages, other other cereal grains could not. Okay. And bring them up and use them and get them into the nutrient cycling in, okay, in so the supply. Okay, so it's like a little more efficient than uh, some of the maybe other Maybe so, yeah. And so the whole deal with the regenerative plot is then you are terminating the existing. So let's say it's May. You are roller crimping and terminating that rye or that crimson clover, whatever you had in your cool season. And at that same time, you are drilling in your blend for your warm season. And so by doing so, you are adhering to one of those regenerative ag principles. Number one, you're not tilling. And number two, you're always keeping the soil covered. And so there's never going to be erosion. So when I... I was under the impression you wanted it to be living cover, but you're saying you're killing it with crimping intentionally. Yes. And it's just the fact there's dead plant biomass laying over the soil that. Okay. Yeah, but it's a, uh, it's a slow death too. Yes. Yeah, so and it's not going to be a hundred percent. So basically you've created a thatch layer to plant into. Yep. Okay. That's exactly right. And that is one of the ways that you accelerate building organic matter mm-hmm. is through that process. And so when you think twice a year, every year, year after year after year, that process of more thatch, more thatch, crimping it, drilling it, crimping it. And some people report that the old adage that all of us would read in our uh, Soil Science 101 book, that it's like, I can't remember the huge number, but it's like, you can increase a percent organic matter every 100 years or something like that. You know, Mm -hmm. it's one of those where I'm not going to get this done in my lifetime type Mm -hmm. numbers to where people over a decade are increasing organic matter by one or 2% using this, this methodology. And I'm not saying that would happen in every case, but there have been reported Mm -hmm. cases of that. Yeah. And the agricultural literature that that has been measured and demonstrated is what you're saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's surprising mm-hmm. to me because I just intuitively, I don't see how it would be that different in terms of the contribution to the organic matter spraying and incorporating the previous crop into the soil versus just crimping it. Um, I think, Will, it is going to have to do with cultivating and restoring the microbial mm. community. And then how they are going to decompose that Mm. and are doing it in a slower way. And and essentially it's you are providing food with that, with your thatch and with your decomposition. You're also providing food with the living, the diversity of living roots. And that's part of it too, is that one reason they want to always keep roots in the ground 
is because you are feeding the microbes. Mm -hmm. And once you remove roots, once you take those plants off the, out of the system, then the, the microbial community is going to decline. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take a while by the food you are providing from the roots of the plants to regenerate and restore those populations. So, so that's what's so critical about it, Will, is keeping all those alive. Mm, okay. So the, the crimping is essentially, for the most part, killing the plant, laying it over, but it leaves the roots underneath the ground, which those are providing food for the microbes. But also the there's literature demonstrating the application of multiple types of synthetics, like the herbicides, pesticides, the nutrients addition even, uh, also degrade or kill the, the microbial community? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, Marcus, you know, none of us ran those experiments. Mm -hmm. well, that all we can... I think that's an important thing. We didn't yeah. have to. We're assuming that uh, other scientists can also do science. <laughs> yeah. And that's the point of publishing it and going through the peer review process. And we as scientists can evaluate the strength of it. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't mean it didn't happen if we didn't do it. Right. That's right. Um, one of the things to, to me that is one of the biggest questions I had going into this, pr pretty na naive now in hindsight, was I grew up thinking that if you want a plant to really grow well, you got to fertilize it. I mean, Marcus, you remember that work we did with Jacob Dykes, mm -hmm. where we, we fertilized those plants, the biomass responded, there was greater phosphorus in those plants, and deer selected for them. Yep, we demonstrated and, it in, this, in the experiment. And, and the answer is, you know, if, if you want a thriving community of plants, you, you got to provide the fertilizer. So you start thinking, but, you know, fertilizer is really a, a, a post-World War II mm -hmm. phenomenon. You know, we weren't doing this way back then, so... I mean, how did we get all this production and yield way back when? And uh, to me, a remarkable relationship, beautiful relationship ecologically, it is one that we see in, and uh, every day for a food plotter, and, and that is the, the legume relationship. We always like legumes because why? Because they fix nitrogen. So now your nitrogen input is going to be less. Mm -hmm. How does a legume what is the symbiosis with a legume to fix nitrogen? It's a symbiosis with a bacteria. Mm -hmm. And so they are swapping, you know, nutrients, mm -hmm. so to speak. They are in partnership. The plant with the, the, the nodules that are formed and then the, the, the bacteria, the rhizobia bacteria, are giving that plant nitrogen, fixing nitrogen and giving it to the plant. The plant, in turn is giving the bacteria carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So that is how they both benefit and thrive. What people I've learned that are experts in regenerative ag and the soil science is that there are symbiotic relationships for all of these plant nutrients and minerals that plants need. But over time, we have broken that relationship in terms of we don't have the fungal and the bacteria community that enable a plant to have a symbiosis with a particular bacteria mm -hmm. to get it phosphorus or to get it calcium or stuff like that. So that is how over, over time, evolutionarily, plants have worked out deals, symbioses with all of these different mm -hmm. bacteria and to be able to scavenge all of these different nutrients. Now we just pour it out of a bag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So when, when Marcus mentioned to me that he thought it'd be a good idea to have you on to talk about this, you know, this regenerative food plotting or regenerative ag more broadly, I was kind of skeptical because although I've heard a lot about people using it, I wasn't convinced yet that that many people are applying it to food plots. Is that true or false? I mean, what what is the relative... Um, rate of adoption you're seeing of this practice and is it becoming widespread? Um, we did, and when I say we, I mean Luke, did a, uh, a survey on social media a couple months ago and has some really good numbers. 
um, it, it was a surprising number, hmm. and, and I, I'm sorry I don't have it in front of me, but it was, uh, I don't know, I want to say over 50% of, of people. Now, there's a catch here, Will. There's a catch coming. Um, we're doing, quote, regenerative practices or some regenerative practices, things like that. But within that, it was... Uh, Maybe they have just reduced tillage, mm-hmm. or maybe they no longer apply glyphosate, for example. And so if you were incorporating a regenerative practice, then you would kind of fall into that category. Mm-hmm. I in no way, shape, or form believe that even 5% of people are incorporating true the whole process regenerative ag techniques mm-hmm. for food plots. Okay. But there are enough people around doing it and are getting some good results, at least from their perspective. They're the ones doing it. And from their perspective, they are getting good results. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, yeah, it's it's not the majority. (laughs) But it is gaining traction fast. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's definitely people that are buying these roller crimpers for food plotting. No doubt. No question about it. I mean, you just visited one that did, right, Will? No, I didn't. But I know I know of some properties that do. I thought the one that you just did told that guy told me he had just bought a roller crimper for it before you'd gone. So maybe not. We didn't talk about uh, that. So maybe he yeah, did. Maybe. Um. <laughs> uh, so you you're going in and drilling the warm season mix which is 10 plus species in it in May when you crimp it. Right. Okay. And then you're growing that <clears throat> through the summer till September, October and crimping and then September, doing the same October. again. Same again. Is That's that, it. Is that the whole system? That's the whole system. So your only yeah. input aside from rolling over with the crimper is putting seeds in the ground. Terminating and planting. And you're using a no-till drill or a seed drill for that? That's correct. Yes. A seed drill. So you can see just right there. I mean, even Luke has quantified that with through year one. I mean, it, it's very, very different. The, the amount of time, the amount of passes, the amount of inputs mm-hmm. that you're doing on the conventional versus the regenerative. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to imagine if you have a food plot where you're planting a cool season and a warm season annual mix in it, you're going to each year, you're going to disc at least once, if not twice before you plant. Um, so let's just call it once. So you're disking once in spring and then once again in fall, you're coming back through the field and planting. So that's two more entries, you know, seasonally. And then, what else am I missing? So you're coming. You got your burn down. If you do that, a with herbicide burn down, that could be two more interest entries. And if you have to come back and cult a pack or drag, that's two more entries. So I'm up yep. to eight right now. We haven't even talked about fertilizer. No, well, not I'd, to mention uh, several of those with things. Fertilizer, like that'd be 10. Yeah. And, and those, those input, those are also inputs because they cost money sure. for the product. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I can see where there could be a substantial difference in cost. Uh, and you don't have the productivity information yet, but at least from agricultural stuff, once they have accomplished this regenerative thing and they they have an intact uh, system, we'll call it, the production is at least uh if uh, efficient financially right so, right uh, I, i'm thinking through well i had a couple of questions and maybe this has been documented or maybe not if the plants are more nutritious do the agricultural folks have more agricultural damage do they, like are all the i'm not aware of I'm not aware of any data to show that. Hmm. That's a good question. I I just wonder if there's any damage research because, I mean, we do a lot of animal damage stuff with agriculture. So if they've been doing this for a while, uh, I suspect somebody's quantified something. (laughs) 
Uh, I'm just thinking about soybeans that are even more attractive to deer. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't <laughs> yeah. really seem like a good idea for, for a producer, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but, but, you know, in terms of the finance, the finances of this whole thing, some economist somewhere knows that you need to factor in losses of crops from pests. So I'm mm-hmm. sure there's some literature on that. I'd be curious to look at it, but. I'm thinking about this from the perspective of a turkey. I, I see the potential value for getting the system, and it inherently is something that I would personally would value. And I could see where, you know, some of the more conservation-oriented uh, landowners might just want to do that, just because it's, mm-hmm. you know, taking care of the land. Uh, but I'm trying to think about from a turkey's perspective, what where is uh how does this compare i guess to what we recommend otherwise in terms of how turkeys might use it and what they might use it for and how, what it conveys in terms of their success the, this i don't know but this will be my prediction um i think for adults turkeys the regenerative would be more attractive simply because what we talked about earlier, if we have a diversity of plant species, I would think that would harbor a greater diversity and maybe abundance of insects. Mm -hmm. And so that is actually something starting this year, we added a component to Luke's project and we're going to start measuring insect diversity and and insect abundance in the Mm -hmm. uh, regenerative versus the conventional. I think it could be the same with seed. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point too, Bronson. I I wasn't thinking about the insect attraction as much from the diversity of plants and of species included in the planting so much as I was thinking about it from what you had said earlier about maybe the micronutrient levels fluctuate or, you know, differ in the plants between regenerative and traditional agriculture. And that might even attract a greater abundance or diversity of insect species. Yeah, or produce a greater abundance, even yeah. maybe a a population level effect on their reproduction. Uh, and, and will p- people that are doing it are saying that very thing? Uh-huh. Now, I, I don't know if they can prove that. Uh, to me, I, I think that's an association. Uh-huh. And whether it's based over space, side by side, or over time of what we used to see and what we see now, but but I hear that quite commonly that turkeys are using these fields a lot more than they used to. Well, and then you have that that dead material, that thatch up underneath the cro- crop that's currently growing, that there's probably a lot of, you know, detritivore de- insects that are taking advantage of that as well. I mean, I could see a bunch yeah. of beetles getting down in there and using that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, I wasn't thinking about it from the adult turkey. I was thinking about it for poles that are exclusively for part of that their polthood they're exclusively <laughs> the eating insects would... polthood oh. you um, like that <laughs> i made that I, up I like it made that. me smile yeah <laughs> <laughs> i i guarantee you at least 26 percent of our audience smiled <laughs> when i said that 26 <laughs> I'm smiling that you came up with 26. I am too. Not 25, not 27, 26. Well, I wanted to be specific. Right, right. Um, No matter how wrong it was. It makes it more believable when you don't round. Yeah, exactly. I did round. The brood rearing, Mark, I, I think that's where regenerative may not do as well. Well, that's what I wanted to bring up to you. Um, my concern, there's two two concerns really but they're both for poles yeah so i think i think the diversity of plants excellent the potential for insect abundance and diversity and all that probably excellent structurally it even may be very good from the plant community structure but i'm worried about that thatch Mm -hmm. and i'm worried about the density of plants it's just a very thick network of plants, all those different species and the different heights and so forth. I can just see that being really dense. When we compare Marcus to a, if you just did a 30, 40 pounds per acre of wheat 
and 10 to 15 pounds per acre of crimson clover come mm-hmm. April, mm-hmm. June, something like that, May. I, I think you're just going to have a very different plot on the regenerative side in terms of the, the density or the network of the plants. I well, don't think a, a pole could get through it. So, well, uh, the two concerns I had, let's say you're, you're uh, planting wheat and you crimp, well, you got a bunch of stuff in there, but you're crimping all that over. So you got that thatch. You're doing that right when, I mean, in May for most of the range of Easterns, even, uh, you are basically right when poults are going to be, you know, uh, really vulnerable because they've just hatched They're in that first couple of weeks of life. So that thatch is not going to be nav- navigable. I'm, I'm guessing because I haven't gone and looked at them, but I have had some people send me some pictures of it. Uh, but then I didn't think about the plant density because I, it was my, at least I was assuming for your warm season that you're drilling in, are those all forbs, all broadleaf plants? No, that they won't be in your typical scenario. There, there could be grasses in there as well. Okay. Uh, like corn and sorghum or uh, sunflower lots of different well, things like that um i don't have the list in front of me <laughs> it's a lot of plants yeah. <laughs> um okay so it could be a problem there too and you've seen it so well, visually to you it looks like it's too dense yeah and i guess i'm thinking more um Forgive me, I'm not a turkey biologist, so I'm I'm thinking more of in the spring of the year, right before you are terminating. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking more of the density of the existing cool season stand yeah. in spring, late spring, and this is going to depend on when the hatch is and when you terminate. Yeah. That was really what that comment was based on. Well, yeah, if you if you leave that that thatch or, or the plants through may so that the young poults would use would have to use that i i agree it's most likely too dense yeah Uh, just based on my experience with conventional ag that has a mix of stuff Uh, but it also would be a problem if you cramped it at that time because of the thatch, I think. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's, I completely agree. Bronson, could you not remedy the plant density issue by just reducing your seeding rate? I mean, because we even do that with conventional ag. Like, I'll recommend a lower seeding rate of wheat just to have more space between plants if the intention is to provide brooding cover in a plot. I, I guess that would be something to consider, Will, but it would from your traditional way of thinking about regen, um, you're just typically wanting to maximize the amount of and diversity of roots, you know, per acre. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're also wanting to keep sunlight directly off of the soil surface. Mm -hmm. You know, you're wanting that buffer with that thatch, you know, you want to, to hold more moisture. You want to insulate and buffer soil temperatures. So basically you're trying to get closed canopy like you do with soybeans. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking too, well, if you went in, could you go in I'm just trying to think, how can you make it more conducive to turkeys? Could you go in and crimp it earlier? Like, could you go in in early April and crimp it and you go ahead? I mean, you could in Florida. I guess in the deep south, maybe. Is that the risk that you might have a late frost? Or is there another reason you can't do that? Um... I think that would depend on, yeah, the, I guess it just depends on how much time you would want to put in between termination of one and planting of the other um, relative to what's going to be the optimal timing for your warm season to grow. Which are usually going to be at least into May. Into May. 
And do you want to stop providing food for deer potentially for that month? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people might make that concession because of their interest in turkeys if it is better for turkeys. People that listen yeah. to this podcast, Bronson. Hmm. I would uh, <laughs> I would just have me uh, an opening, a thinned forest adjacent to that region food plot yeah. and put it on a two-year burn rotation and let that be my brew. Well, that's, that's what I was going to say with all this. If this is something that a landowner was really interested in, and I think we've just discussed many ecological reasons, you know, conservation-related reasons that they might consider it, I think it's fine as long as you're not dependent on your food plots for brooding cover. Yeah. But a lot of people are. Well, and I, I commonly am, I mean, I know you are too, Will. I'm coaching people in how to use their food plots for brooding. Right. Especially, here, here's a scenario that both of y'all deal with constantly. I lease land. I can't do anything except for openings. What I can plant in my food plot. That's what they got. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, some, I think it's good for us to have the dialogue to talk about it and think through. And I'm just wondering, are there ways that you, like if you could just cramp earlier so that that thatch has some time to break down and you could go ahead and seed, you're just doing it a little early for most of the plants that you're planting. But in the deep south, you might be able to get away with that. Uh you know, so you'd still be bringing on your stand of warm seasons in concert with killing, you know, terminating the cool seasons, but you're doing it at a time that the two problems that we were talking about would uh, better coincide or be more conducive with that, that early pulp, pulp yeah. rearing. So, Another thing I was thinking of is, man, you could just crimp it and then burn off all that thatch, but that would defeat the purpose. Yeah. But it does bring up another question, concern that I have. Part of the thatch, the the intent or, or a, an ancillary benefit, I don't know if it's an intent, is to also suppress weeds, colonizing intentionally, right? Right. A lot of those weeds are the same ones that I'm coaching people on how to manage their food plot to encourage colonizing, aka Forbes, native Forbes. So that's another potential issue that I could uh, I could see arising. Well, I think there's something important that Bronson said earlier is that we have the whole regenerative ag, right, in quotes, but then we have regenerative practices that yeah. each make individual contributions to that more holistic practice. Right. And so maybe that, maybe instead of thinking this of this as an all or nothing proposition, if it, if the entire holistic package that is regenerate, regenerative ag, I can I have a hard time, such a hard time <laughs> with that word. Um, I do too. Stale. It's we'll not it conducive right. to your Turkey objectives. Then maybe you just pick and choose the practices from that, that are, and recognize that we're probably still benefiting some soil health and some water health and, you know, preventing erosion, cutting down on our weed problems, decreasing our, our synthetic, you know, chemical use, all that kind of thing. Um, but we're still able to accomplish our wildlife management objectives. I, I think you hit the, the nail on the head there. And, you know, the, I guess the principles that I just des described, um, that, that's uh, the general framework of the way you need to approach it, meaning that if you want to restore soil health and the, the microbe community as soon as you can, then this would be the way to do it. But there are a lot of people I've heard over the years, you know, digging into this stuff that do some things a little bit different. Um, I've heard from some people that, you know, about every three years or four years, we need to incorporate a little bit of tillage, mm -hmm. for example, maybe they have an invasive species they've got to tr try to negate. So, I mean, there's all sorts of ways you can work around this. And Marcus, for both of y'all, it might be that I'm going to start tinkering more with se seeding rate. I might take some of these species out because I am really focused on brooding. 
And I want to make sure that in my food plots, I'm also providing that. So um, I think there's a lot of flexibility. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, you could mix and match, but uh, you also could adjust the way that you're doing it. Like we, you know, I was trying to work through earlier, but I, I'm do you, in your experiment, do you have a comparison that is like an old field? We sure do. You do? Yes. Okay. We do. So mm-hmm. one that has a diversity of native plants in it. Right. Yes. Okay. It's not like a, it's not a old field of bahia grass or fescue or something. <laughs> well, we want to make sure we have a good warm season old field of Bermuda okay. and cool season of, of ryegrass. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Well, I was going to say earlier, I didn't hear rotation. ryegrass mentioned as one of the plants in the mix. So if you're just excluding that plant from this, it's got to be a win for much of the South. <laughs> uh, so, And the purpose of us adding the old field, I mean, there's going to be a lot of good stuff to come of that. But what we wanted to do is what will the what could be changes in soil health independent of uh, the diverse blend, the, the cultivating it with all of these different plants? What, what happens if we just take glyphosate and MPK and tillage out of the system? What do we see there? Mm-hmm. And then the other with the regenerative part is, we're doing all that and we're doing with the, the species blend and the termination, et cetera. So mm-hmm. we want to try to tease that apart. Right. Well, what the other, uh, the other thing I was thinking through, you know, when we're, we're t- trying to coach people through planting a cool season plot, let's say crimson and wheat. Uh, that's one of my go-tos. We're trying to coach that into a brooding plot you know high quality brooding cover during that time uh i'm my intent is to encourage a sweet you know often high diversity of forbs colonizing that that are native and i guess i'm struggling and i just would like to hear you work through this and respond to it i'm struggling for why it would be better for soil health for you to crimp all that stuff and then plant something in it again, as opposed to just letting it go fallow and fall over. And then all those native forbs that are going to still be colonizing at the same time you'd plant, then they would grow through the summer. And they're also high quality deer forages often, and they're providing really high quality structure for turkeys often, uh, as long as you don't have you know, invasive problems like ryegrass. Would that not produce a very similar thing, if not even better? Potentially. Um, I I think that the reason for planting is that you're pretty darn sure of what the result is going to be. Yeah. Because it's the seed you planted. Yeah. So So yeah, Marcus, if you have a track record, knowing what plants are going to respond, yeah, maybe you skip the warm season planting altogether. Well, in that case, um, let, let's say uh, we, we do this. Well, we've got to have the diversity in the, the fall, so it wouldn't work. But uh, let's say we're planting in the fall into our, we could crimp it even. You could crimp your thatch of native forbs that, you know, that you've done. And then you're, you're just seeding right into that, just like you would normally. And then letting that transition into that forbland to go through the summer. And then that be your rotation. That to me seems very similar, but it what it almost certainly would require up front is for you to take some action to get rid of some problem plants. Mm-hmm. For us, like we have talked about ad nauseum, it, ryegrass is going to be a part of that. You're going to have to get rid of it. It might be fescue, uh, Bermuda. We, you know, we've, we've all got our weed problems, uh, but you wouldn't want to let those dominate. So you'd want to get rid of those and then get on this conventional idea. I wonder why that wouldn't be a step even farther down the regenerative act. Quite possibly could be. I think that is, uh, you know, what we're always encouraging is for, you know, people to be scientists, 
And mm-hmm. so, Marcus, I think what you just described there, if, if you had the area, whether it be in one field or whether it's a patchwork of fields, is do one with the, the warm season planning. Do one with what you're describing or this half of the field with the way you're describing and, and just see what works and monitor the response and see what you like. Mm-hmm. Um I don't think there's any, there, there aren't any rules on here saying <laughs> that if you don't do it this way, you're not regenerative. Yeah. I would say the only way you start making it, you're not going to have the benefits of it being regenerative and where you start hurting the soil microbiome is if you start adding the synthetics and you start adding the tillage mm-hmm. with any frequency, then you're going to, you're going to kill the, you're not going to kill the system, but you're going to slow it down and have to rebuild it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I even wonder about you know, I always want to put fire in there somewhere. So I'm thinking about yeah. now what, how long, I guess it could be pretty long in some places, but if you went in and crimped in April and let that die over the next 10 days and then go in and burn that thatch off, I mean, you're going to get a flush really quickly, especially if you do it right before rain of yeah. forbs. So you you have a minimized your duration of of uh, not having that insulation, I guess, before there's plants back. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say you would uh, diminish your your micro community doing that, but you're you're having a period of time that you're not having living roots. Mm-hmm. And again, going back to our legume r- relationship, you're not providing food to the microbes for some period of time. We'll see that somewhat conflicts with the fire ecology literature though. Okay. And I don't know if it's just because there's a different community of microbes there probably is, but that's what I hear commonly is that the, you know, fer- frequent fire in some of these systems is encouraging a really robust and highly diverse community of bacteria fungi and microbes just in general, uh, particularly ones that are not plant pathogenic or, or what's the other word? Uh, well, that's probably a good word. Pathogenic, you know, they're negative to the plants that we want to colonize. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I can't comment on that. <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, the reason is I, I just recently recorded a fire university episode with a guy that studies fungi and microbes in fire. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was talking about how frequent fire in, in the pine savannas promote this really robust, highly diverse community underground. Hmm. I. I don't dispute that. That's what he found. Yeah. Well, hey, one thing, Marcus, I, I do want to mention that that we're doing because uh, you and Will, I think, both mentioned the, the economic side of this. Um, one thing we are also going to measure is all of these inputs. So at the end, and we're not just going to use one year. This will be every single year because. There could be a year we have a drought. There could be a year it's above average rainfall. So we want that to be smoothed out over three or four growing seasons. But where we want to end up from a deer centric perspective is for every, let's just say a thousand pounds of deer food, conventional cost this, regenerative cost that. Mm -hmm. And so that way you can literally start seeing what kind of benefits Am, am I getting, so are the deer responding? Am I seeing more deer or less deer? Let's just even say that's a wash is that, you know what? I'm not seeing any difference in deer response. We can even look at this economically mm-hmm. is that one way is, is cheaper or not. And, and what in the end, when this project is done uh, from, from a good extension perspective, we just want to lay all of this information out there, you know, vetted scientifically and let people make their own decision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what we're all here for. No, I, yeah. yeah, I think, and I think this was a really good conversation because it went a long way towards helping me understand what this whole system is about. And I guess where it's left me is I've gone from thinking, you know, this is probably a practice that isn't very um, well aligned 
with a lot of times our turkey habitat management objectives to one that I'm cautiously optimistic that can be modified in certain ways mm. to be more conducive to achieving those turkey related objectives. Yeah. Yeah. I that agree. Is, that's something we hope to, to help with as well. Yeah. It's that taking that into it's account. that thoughtful tinkering, right? Yeah. That's right. I was just thinking about your, your cost analysis. I mean, really for a lot of people, what it boils down to is not even the cost per production, but the cost per opportunity. So it'd be interesting to see, uh, you know, how many, uh, how many mature buck photos do you get in the regenerative mm-hmm. versus, you know, the, the conventional, uh, or, or how many turkeys and how many poult observations, you know, those kinds of things per dollar. And it's going to depend on, on limiting factors. You know, Mm. every, every property is different. And so, I mean, you could come up with a scenario where what we really have to do on our property is we need high quality food Mm -hmm. is, you know, we we are, we are high quality food deficient in this, in this area, for example. And so the one thing that we want to do is is pounds of biomass. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can also easily see a scenario where you're in a landscape where there's plenty of conventional agriculture. Mm-hmm. There's already a lot of food on the landscape. Maybe you just want to increase deer sighting. And so is there something to these plants? Maybe it's not the same biomass, but maybe they are more nutrient dense. Maybe because of the diversity of the planting, they are more attractive to deer. So you can simply look at here's what it costs to plant it and here is the response in terms of deer sighting. So yeah. you're just literally going to be able to pick and choose what part you want out of this. Yeah. Well, and you know what you and I have learned from research projects together and from a lot of the body of literature from Provenza, they, they may, you may have higher deer use just because they mix a diverse diet and they're more easily able to do that when the plants are together. Yeah. Uh, I was actually it, it, exactly wondering right. how do you detangle the convention or yeah, the, the treatment mechanistically, how do you detangle the treatment from the nutrient availability from the effects of diversity? Mm-hmm. So you're basically looking at the net effects of all of them together. You, you, you are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's actually something we talked to Fred Provenza about. Really? <laughs> Those very issues. Yeah. yeah. And I, well, I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did we miss anything? Was there anything you, you were expecting us to ask that we didn't, you thought would come up? Um, I, I think we just covered that. I, I wanted to make sure, uh, you know, w- what we're doing you know, we're, we're going to be measuring uh, as best we can. Probably the most difficult thing for us to measure is what is soil health mm-hmm. and what all does that mean? So I think that's going to be the most difficult one to really, to really measure. But we're working with experts and they are giving us different, different tests that we're using. So we're going to measure the changes in soil over time. We're going to measure the changes in plants over time in terms of their quality, nutrient density, et cetera the wildlife response to that. And we're adding the Turkey component this year. And and then finally the economics. And so changes in soil, does soil affect the plants? Does the plant affect deer siding and Turkey sidings? And then what does it cost to do either one of these, either one of these routes? Hmm. That's kind of the gist. It's a great experiment. I look forward to hearing more about it. And we'll definitely have to have Bronson back on when we start getting some results in. Yeah, for sure. And if any of your um, listeners want to go to our MSU Deer Lab social media, I think I know Luke posted videos most recently, like a week or two ago. So if you just want to take a look at here's what a regen, cool season regen plot looks like mm-hmm. versus the conventional ag, he's got some video there on our social media. You can take yeah, a look at that. We'll link at, it in the show notes. Just at MSU Deer Lab. At MSU Deer Lab. Okay. We'll, uh-huh. we'll get. Uh, Charlotte to link where they can just click on the link in the show notes and go right to the post. Yeah. Well, cool. So, well, I appreciate the opportunity guys. Yeah. We're, yeah. No, I mean, thank really you. Enjoyed it. I feel like, uh, I feel like I learned a lot. Yeah. Hey man, the, the learning curve for me has been really steep. Will. yeah, it's, uh, 
it's a different way of thinking about food plots. And yeah. uh, well, it's got it's, you know how I usually do, but it's got me spiraling into all sorts of wormholes now. Which is a pun since yeah. you're supposed to have more worms in there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I start thinking about wow, turkeys might even dust in them more because of the microbial community that they're trying to, <laughs> to get on. You know, like you don't know what. There's all kinds of weird stuff like that. The, there's going to be the somebody promoting dig, dig what you just said look. online next week. <laughs> That's literally just a hypothesis. As that a sales, could be as a sale, they're going to be using it as a sales pitch. It's a hypothesis that could be tested. <laughs> I'm not well, saying it's I, I anticipate <laughs> me getting a number of texts over the next couple of weeks of "Have you thought about?" Yeah. Oh yeah. You should. You should do this. We'll put your cell phone number in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> right back at you, Marcus. <laughs> yeah, he's got a, he's got show notes yeah. of his own. So. <laughs> yeah, I can put some stuff on YouTube as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, right. you have put quite a bit of mess on me <laughs> online. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I, you know, we did a video, Bronson, where I laid on the ground. I don't know if I'd want to lay in that bug-infested regen plot. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you would if you knew it was providing bugs for turkeys. Well, maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. And quail. Yeah. Well, good stuff. We really enjoyed yeah, the conversation, and uh, I did too. Yeah, I'm glad to finally hear more about this this uh, practice because yeah. now I understand more, at least what what it's the goal not quite is. as black box to me now. It's like gray box. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of feel like. Well, hey, let's do it again in like a year, yeah. and we can share some results. Yeah, that'd be great. And have some data to go along with this. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, right before next planting season would be great. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody out there for listening. We appreciate all the support. If you haven't yet, take time. We appreciate it. If you'd read, you know, uh, rate the podcast, take the survey. We uh, this is another one. We've gotten a few requests to talk about, so we're trying to cover some of the stuff that you all tell us that you want to hear about. So if you haven't had a chance, go ahead and click on the survey. It only takes a minute, and uh, let us know what you think. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University podcast network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org.